Hutchins has refused to deal with the concept of separation of church and state at all, or the image, the metaphor. He says, the wall has done what walls usually do. It has obscured the view. The wall is offered as a reason. It is not a reason. It is a figure of speech. He went on, the wall has no future because it cannot help us to learn. Abraham counseled against heavy reliance on the image because, quote, the doctrine of the wall is no solution per se. It fails because the necessary line depends overridingly on public policy considerations and on the interests of contending groups. Clancy has argued against the concept from yet another angle. The wall of separation metaphor is an unfortunate and inexact description of the American church-state situation. What we have constitutionally is not a wall, but a logical distinction between two orders of competence. The wall of separation between church and state, as it's conceived by most absolute separatists in America, is not really a constitutional concept, it's rather a private doctrine. Philip Curlin wrote, the principle of separation is meant to provide a starting point for solutions to problems brought, brought before the court, not a mechanical answer to them. Cowper advocated understanding this principle as derived from the First Amendment and consequently dependent on it for its meaning. He says, the Zorak opinion recognizes that the First Amendment itself says nothing about the separation of church and state. Separation is not in itself a starting point in constitutional thinking. It follows and is required only to the extent that it flows from the clauses related to non-establishment and the free exercise of religion. Katz recalled the purpose of separation. Separation ordinarily promotes religious freedom. It is defensible so long as it does so, and only so long. In another work, he drew out an important implication of a policy of absolute separation. A rule of absolute separation would mean outlawing provisions designed to implement religious freedom, as in the armed forces. The inconsistencies in the application of the separation doctrine moved Brickman to observe, when a principle such as that of church-state separation has been consistently violated in common consent over the years, it is reasonable to inquire if it's not been downgraded to an unprincipled or an anti-principle. Now, if the constitutional provision forbidding an establishment of religion and the equally constitutional guarantee of the free exercise of religion conflict, which takes precedence? Opinion is scattered, and the decisions of the court have varied. However, Burns' reading of history led him to maintain when the two clauses conflict, the free exercise clause has generally been held to rule. This has occurred because the Supreme Court has elevated religious liberty to the position of a preferred freedom. Lawrence Tribe of Harvard has asserted the free exercise principle should be dominant in any conflict with the anti-establishment principle. Such dominance is the natural result of tolerating religion as broadly as possible, rather than thwarting at all costs even the faintest appearance of establishment. James Powell made an interesting suggestion as to why the Supreme Court has had such difficulty in the parochial school aid courses, in cases, for example, when the free exercise clause appears as such a ready solution. He perceived the heart of the matter to lie in this area. Quote, the Supreme Court conceives free exercise of religion in such narrow terms, that is, within the walls of the church or the home. It is not really a co cognizant of violations of the rights of others for which religion and education are much more intimately joined. So let's turn then to the issue of religious freedom. <coughs> Quite some time ago, astute observers of the political scene noted a disturbing trend in the jargon being employed by the Obama administration as our constitutional right to freedom of religion was being spoken of as freedom of worship. Is this just quibbling over words? Well, words, my friends, matter. For instance, if you're living in a house, does it really matter whether you're called the landlord or the tenant? You know it does. 
coming from an Eastern European background, with a martyr on the Ukrainian side of the family, coincidentally on this feast of St. Joseph that, I have a special sensitivity to religious freedom issues. For decades, the Soviets proudly and boldly proclaimed that they had freedom of worship, and even that wasn't true. But there was certainly no freedom of religion. The same situation prevails in communist China today, as well as in many Islamic states. Pope Benedict obviously agrees with the interpretation I'm offering, as he often does, <laughs> as he chose for the theme of 2011's World Day of Peace, religious freedom, the path to peace. The Vatican communique accompanying the announcement explained, in many parts of the world, there exist various forms of restrictions or denials of religious freedom, from discrimination and marginalization based on religion to acts of violence against religious minorities. <laughs> the statement also highlighted situations, quote, where communities of believers are not a minority and where more sophisticated forms of discrimination and marginalization exist on the cultural level and in the spheres of public, civil, and political participation. It went on to declare, religious freedom is rooted in the equal and inherent dignity of man and is oriented toward the search for unchangeable truth. They called religious freedom the freedom of freedoms. And the Pope's conclusion, quote, it is inconceivable that believers should have to suppress a part of themselves, their faith, in order to be active citizens. It should never be necessary to deny God in order to enjoy one's rights. He returned to this topic in an unlimited address to American bishops in January, and again back in June, noting that many bishops had informed him of the unprecedented and unrelenting assaults on the church's freedom launched by the Obama administration. Now let us be clear. The church is not lobbying for preferential freedom. She simply expects demands the rights which are hers by nature and by the Constitution. Nor are we talking about establishing a theocracy. Here it's important to distinguish between secularity and secularization. There is a good secularity, which the Church has come to recognize, especially as she has viewed the American situation from the vantage point of the 20th century. <coughs> Just when Father John Courtney Murray helped the Universal Church come to this awareness through his 1960 groundbreaking book, We Hold These Truths, and then through his contributions to the Decree on Religious Liberty of Vatican II, Vinyatata Sumana. Father Murray stressed, freedom for religion, not freedom from religion, was the goal of the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights. Secularization, on the other hand, is a conscious effort to marginalize religion, religious influence, and religiously motivated citizens. <coughs> Let me anticipate one of my ultimate conclusions by submitting at this moment that vigorous secularization demands vigorous evangelization for the sake of the church's future and for the sake of society's future as well. <coughs> Furthermore, we need to consider what we might term the fundamental religiosity of Americans first noted by the Frenchman Alexis de Tocqueville in 1835. He writes in Democracy in America, the religious aspect was the first thing that struck my attention. That same observation comes from the pen of the great English convert G.K. Chesterton, who in 1922 dubbed the United States the nation with the soul of a church. That basic religiosity is still operative in spite of many secularizing forces exercised by a vocal, even if tiny, minority. The liberal media elite consistently attempt to drive public opinion in a leftward direction. But numerous studies have demonstrated that those people are very, very far removed from the average citizen. Indeed, their positions on matters like the existence of God, the importance of church membership and attendance, abortion, pornography, and issues of sexuality are polar opposites to those of the vast majority of the population. This drift was first documented by Lichter and Rothman in their study in 1980, which has consistently been updated. 